So we have the pleasure of, as our guest, uh, Dr. Dean Bell, uh, President and CEO of the Spiritus Institute in Chicago. Is there a neighborhood that you're in in Chicago? I am in West Rogers Park. That's where this institute is? Uh, Spiritus is downtown. We're right in the center of Chicago in the South Loop. Okay, so now you all know where uh, wherever that center is. And as I understand, um, less than a mile from where our convention hotel is going to be next uh, next uh, next year, I believe. And uh, we uh, we had wanted to have the Spiritus Institute to talk to us because certainly as our committee is looking at uh, ways that we can all support the uh, fight against uh, anti-Semitism, that it's come to a point where, uh, as we'll talk about shortly, uh, there's now a specific certificate that will be um, uh, as being taught by the, uh, the Institute. So uh, there's this wonderful glass building. How many floors is, is there? Is your building? Uh, the building is 10 stories. It's 114,000 square feet, silver lead certified and 100% renewable energy. Excellent. It's beautiful, uh, beautiful building. And as uh, you can see that where there is in terms of the location of the Institute and the theme of the Spurtis Institute being Jewish learning for a better world. We should all hope for such. The Institute, in fact, and I think uh, Dr. Bell will be talking about it, is celebrating its 100th year um, in existence. So it certainly has a history. And I gather that is a photo from somewhere around 1924. Um, so that is, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Sorry, I'm just keep admitting here, people. And this is just a very short list of some of the programs that they have. Uh, tonight, we're going to be concentrating on um, the Leadership Certificate in Combating Anti-Semitism for Professionals. And the scene there from uh, Tree of Life, um, uh, not the start of anti-Semitism, but certainly uh, a very sad, uh, heightened um, understanding and realization, not just to the Jewish community, but I think to Americans and the world, that anti-Semitism was still uh, with us. So. Uh, Dean, I appreciate your uh, your being on here. Can you offer a bit of a of an overview on the institute and of your role at the institute, please? Yeah, sure. First, Irv, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. It's uh, it's really wonderful to see all of you and to meet some of you. I hope I'll see you in Chicago, maybe when you're here for uh, for your convention. So I'm Dean Bell, I'm the president and CEO. I've been in this role for six years, but I've been at the institution for thirty years. I did get a cake. I didn't get a watch or anything, but the uh, cake was. <laughs> dry, but it was it was nice. Um, Spertus has been around for 100 years. We were founded in 1924 as the College of Jewish Studies in Chicago. At the time, it was one of five non-denominational Hebrew teacher colleges in North America. You might be familiar with some of the others, Boston Hebrew College, Gratz College, Baltimore Hebrew University, and Cleveland College of Jewish Studies. Our focus is a little bit different, especially over the last two decades. The emphasis has been on applied learning, on Jewish leadership, as well as deep academic Jewish studies. We like to say when we were founded, our focus was on advancing the field of higher Jewish education. At the time, if you wanted to study Jewish studies in a serious way, you went to a yeshiva, you went to one of the uh, seminaries, or you went to one of a handful of universities to do a secular study. Spurtus has always been at the intersection of higher education and Jewish community. Much of our focus has been on training Jewish educators, Jewish com communal professionals, Jewish leaders, but also serving as a resource and uh, sort of consultant for the Jewish community. Over many years, we've had undergraduate degrees, we've had a variety of programs, but our focus really since the mid 1980s has been on graduate education. We have students in 26 states and nine foreign countries. We do a lot of work in Israel and Europe and South America in addition to the United States. And our focus is really on how we apply Jewish learning, Jewish thought, texts and experiences to address some of the most complicated pressing issues of today and the future. And we do that in a whole bunch of ways. And obviously we'll be talking about some of the programs at Spurtis, I like to say our, our sort of signature pedagogy is sitting at the intersection of theory and practice. My, my undergraduate alma mater is the University of Chicago, where they like to say that's well and good in practice, but how does it work in theory? Here at Spurtis, we actually think both of those come together in important ways. And so we have a different approach. And particularly when it comes to anti-Semitism, I know we'll talk a bit about it. Our sense is that there isn't a playbook. There aren't five or six steps that one has to take, but rather we need to understand the nuance and the complexity and the context of anti-Semitism if we're gonna be successful in addressing it. 
So Spurtis has been around a long time. It's a really exciting institution doing great work. And uh, as I mentioned and showed the picture, we have this beautiful facility in downtown Chicago uh, that was built by architects that designed uh, Millennium Park Fountain and have done some really amazing work, including work on the on the um, US consulate in, uh, in Jerusalem. So really interesting people doing significant work. Happy to share more about specifics, but I'm sure there are other more tangible questions. I appreciate that. Um... I'll start with some questions, uh, but if you have questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat or just raise your hand if you'd like to ask them uh, directly. Um, who were the Spurtis brothers and why did they start the Institute way back in 1924? Yeah, so they actually didn't begin the institution. We changed the name in 1970. There were two brothers, Maurice and Herman, who left Ukraine during the Russian Revolution. They moved to New York, uh, learned English, and then eventually moved to Chicago, and uh, at some point opened up a factory that mass produced steel picture frames around the time that the Brownie camera came out. So they made their local fortune, they became philanthropists and leaders in the Chicago Jewish community, and in recognition of that, we changed the name of the institution in 1970 from the College of Jewish Studies to the Spurtis College of Judaica. Uh, Maurice was a great collector of Judaica. He had thousands of pieces. He donated them to the institution and they form the core of our collection. We have about 15,000 pieces of material, culture and fine art in our institution. It's one of the largest collections. We also have a library of 120,000 books, which is the second largest collection of Judaica between the coasts. And uh, we have archival materials, about 3,000 linear feet of archival materials related to Chicago and regional Jewish history. We have some other sort of gems in the collection, including uh, 2,500 maps of the Holy Land from the 16th century on, which is the sixth largest collection of maps of the Ottoman Empire in the world. Uh, we have a significant amount of videos and DVDs and a music collection because we had a cantorial school here for two years in the 1950s. So really interesting collection. The other brother, Herman Spurtis, I actually knew personally. Uh, he lived to about 106 and he used to come in every Tuesday to give me marketing advice and to take a picture of me. I don't know what he did with the pictures and the marketing advice was so-so, but uh, he was really an amazing guy. <laughs> Actually, that's a, a wonderful story, and congrats, uh, Mazel Tov, on the 100-year um, anniversary. You. I feel like I've only been here for 30, but it feels sometimes like I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so primarily, we were connected uh, because we have learned you have a new certificate program, the Leadership Program for Combating Anti-Semitism for Professionals and for Lay Leaders. You state that uh, Jewish leaders need to be equipped to respond to anti-Semitic incidents with strength, skill, expertise. Mm -hmm. And to be effective, they need training. How did you determine that such a certificate was uh, needed? Yeah, so uh, there's a few ways, actually. We started thinking about this program probably about five years ago when we saw there was an uptick in anti-Semitic incidents across North America and around the globe. And we felt we had a unique perspective on this because in our Jewish studies program, we teach a lot of courses on Jewish history, on history of anti-Semitism, on intergroup relations. And in our leadership program, we teach a lot about communications and change and uh, you know, working with different groups. I think it came very clear to me at one point when I was speaking with one of our uh, colleagues who's an executive director of a large Jewish community center. And uh, while I was on the phone with him, he got a bomb threat. And we got into a very long conversation. This is a, somebody who's a really talented, experienced, seasoned professional. He's never had that before. And, and how do you respond to this? And it became pretty clear that even our best leaders uh, aren't really equipped to deal with some of these new issues that they're facing, uh, that their organizations are struggling through. And after conversations with him, we put together an advisory council of academics as well as practitioners in the field. And we tried to understand what the most important parts of combating anti-Semitism might be and how we could bring our specific perspective and the unique work that we do as an institution uh, to bear on solving this problem. I will say, and I shared this with Irv, I wasn't sure I'd share it, but you're all a bunch of friends. Uh, I have a personal story as well, which is uh, in 1999, I was shot five times by a white supremacist coming home from the synagogue. And so for me, the personal part of this uh, combined with the academic stuff, much of my work has been on the history of anti-Semitism and Jewish Christian relations and our work in leadership meant that Spurtis was really sitting in a very unique kind of place uh, to address these kinds of issues. And we identified very quickly that there was a need for executive directors or senior leaders who had the role of uh, combating anti-Semitism 
to have training. It was an area that was not being addressed in, in really any other organization in a deep kind of way. Uh, and since then, and we'll talk about it later, we, we've noted that there's, there's an opportunity to train lay leaders as well, particularly as they're working with senior professionals at a variety of Jewish organizations. But for us, a lot of things came together and we felt that we had something valuable to add and that there was a unique opportunity here to advance the work of the community in these really difficult and trying times. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, personal story and uh, I just amazing that uh, our work that thank you for for sharing that. I am grateful every day to be here so delighted to join you. So how and, and where is the certificate offered? Is it just there? Is it Chicago? Is it online? Is it a combination? So like most of what we do, we are sort of a hybrid institution. Okay. We do some things online and some things in person. As an educator, I feel like, uh, well, technology is wonderful. Being in the classroom with people is really essential, especially when we're dealing with deep, difficult topics like anti-Semitism or intergroup relations or things like that, or conflict education. So the program combines a number of elements. Um, we have parts of it that are online beginning uh, at, at the start of the program and parts that are online at the end. And in between, we invite participants on campus for a week to engage with a number of other issues. One of the things that holds the whole program together is the sort of practical application. And while we have some academic components to it, it's really based on case studies and practical application. And there's five main components to the program. The first is sort of historical context and historical themes. In four weeks, we're not gonna give you a history of anti-Semitism, but we wanna pull out some of the, the most significant themes and stereotypes and motifs that we experience even today and place them in historical context, okay. trying to understand how we interpret them, you know, how we might be able to understand them and then respond to them. While students are on campus, we look at um, intra-communal uh, conversations. The Jewish community is very diverse. Many communities have people who have different experiences with anti-Semitism. If you're Holocaust adjacent or if you're a teenager, you might have a very different kind of approach. We have different political orientations and sometimes we have different definitions of what we mean by anti-Semitism. So that first module is trying to understand the diversity within our community and how we build an opportunity to work together across the differences in our communities. The second module uh, in the on-campus experience relates to uh, communications. And that means how do we communicate in times of crisis? What are our key audiences? What is the messaging we do? When do we respond? And when sometimes do we choose not to respond? This is also an area where we start to think about online hatred and social media and how we think about those and, and responding to developments in those areas. The third module online really deals with the intercommunal space. That is, how do we think about building relationships within and outside the Jewish community? How do we think about advocacy? How do we begin to develop uh, sort of bridges to other communities, but also understand anti-Semitism in the broad spectrum of other hatred and bias as well. There are many things that are very similar about anti-Semitism and other hatred, though there's some obvious things that are quite unique about anti-Semitism. The last part of the program we do online is an opportunity to think about change leadership, because we what, what we want our participants to do is to um, take the lessons they're learning, take them back to their home communities and organizations, develop new initiatives, evaluate them, and, and do the important work that's happening in the trenches. So we ask students to do a final project that involves some reflection on the development of a new program. That's excellent. Very comprehensive and convenient in this day in terms of uh, taking and, uh, taking those uh, that content. What type of Jewish leaders does your organization feel would benefit from this certificate? So uh, we have two tracks right now. The, the track that is in its third cohort is related to uh, senior leaders and executive directors. Those tend to be people from organizations such as Jewish Community Relations Councils, Jewish Federations, JCCs, Hillel's and the like. Though increasingly over the last year and a half, we've seen people come from teen education spaces, interfaith organizations, political organizations, even some uh, foundations that are grappling with these kinds of issues. So a really sort of diversification of the participants. The second track, which we're developing uh, and will launch in February, those of you interested, the application will be in October. The first application deadline is October. The second and final is December. The program starts in February with four online sessions and then three days in Chicago and then four, four sessions after, I believe, um, is for lay leaders. And that's for people who are 
uh, experienced board members of Jewish organizations in a variety of different uh, settings across North America. So two sets of audiences. <clears throat> we are looking at smaller kinds of training opportunities in other spaces as well. So we've done some training for <clears throat> high school principals and superintendents in public schools here in Chicago, uh, for teen educators and others in Boston, for uh, young Jewish leaders in Hartford and other communities. So there are a number of other areas that we will expand this work into, but our main focus in terms of the certificate has been on uh, senior professional leaders and on now lay leaders. Excellent. Um, I, that's great you mentioned that it, it certainly goes beyond the Jewish community. And I know that here in the D.C. area, our uh, Jewish Federation, Greater Washington, has done some programs and the JCRC has done some programs for uh, our Fairfax County Public Schools. So. I think there certainly is demand uh, uh, beyond just the Jewish community. Um, our FJMC members represent uh, many different demographics. Many are lay leaders, such as president of the synagogues club or regional leaders. Um, and many are full-time Jewish professionals uh, who work at local federation, community centers, or, or others as well. How do those organizations view uh, the need for this type of training? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that I think every organization realizes there's a need for this. And um, we're all experiencing anti-Semitism a variety of different ways. And I know in, in your leadership roles, I'm sure that you are uh, working closely with professionals, but also other members of the community. One of the modules that we've added is around mental health, because even if you don't experience an anti-Semitic incident directly, it's having a significant toll on the conversations that we have on our own mental health. And part of what we're training our uh, professionals to do is think about how to take care of themselves, but also how to take care of all the other people that are working for them or with whom they work. So there's, uh, I think the organizations are realizing there's a great deal of need. It funnels down into a lot of different areas. One of the things that I found surprising, I suppose, over the last couple of years is that many organizations have created a specific position to address anti-Semitism. So a chief anti-Semitism officer <laughs> or a, a specific person within an organization that is tasked largely to deal with intercommunal relations and questions of anti-Semitism. I think every organization struggles a bit with this. Sometimes it, it's a, a sort of very general level around community relations. And sometimes because we actually have incidents, whether they're physical attacks or they're graffiti or vandalism or threats. I was sharing with Irv earlier that during the Democratic National Convention, Everybody was a little bit worried about the protests and whether there would be anti-Semitic incidents. Thankfully, we didn't have much aside from some unfortunate uh, protest at the Council General of Israel's office, uh, which, which did make the news and I think resulted in about 60 arrests. <clears throat> but what we did see is that we had people who were out for nefarious purposes, leaving false bomb threats at various organizations, including ours. Uh, they were fairly easy to detect as fake um, because they were alleged to be police reports, but they didn't look like police reports, and they had the wrong name of our institution, and so many things that were problematic with them. And our sense was that what they were trying to do was to divert the police resources during the convention, not that they were actually going to have any serious uh, attacks. But yeah, everybody, I think, was a little bit concerned. There have been some anti-Israel um, protests here in the city that have gotten some news. Usually they go further north. They don't usually come down to the southern part of the of the main center of the city. But there was some concern about that. And I think that reflects for me the, the notion that almost every Jewish organization right now is struggling a little bit with some aspect of anti-Semitism. You know, I'll share, I did a, a scholar in residence at a synagogue in Milwaukee the week after October 7th. And I did five lectures, but the, the last two sessions were with uh, high school and uh, uh, elementary and high school students, eighth to 10th grade. So it was literally one week after October 7th. And to hear the stories of the things that they had experienced before October 7th, in terms of anti-Semitism on the playground, difficult comments people were making, and then the dramatic increase in the sort of virulence of those comments after <clears throat> October 7th was really troubling. And so it became very clear that you know, almost every space within the Jewish community, we are struggling with some aspect of this, of this challenge. We also have, I think, the you know the added difficulty that we don't want this to be the defining value of our Jewish community and our Jewish identity and Jewish experience. So part of what we are, are doing in the program is think about some of the ways we combat anti-Semitism are by strengthening our identities and educating ourselves and thinking about ways to engage with others and not simply to do things that are you know, in, in the sort of more strict sense of combating anti-Semitism. 
But my experience, and, I, and I'm sure you all have anecdotes, is that each of us has some experience. I know the Pew study, for example, and the AJC report and others have noted that the vast majority of Jews have had at least a secondhand experience and many have had a firsthand experience of an anti-Semitic incident. And that 60% of people, and uh, more than 50% on college campuses, are afraid to show publicly their Jewish identity. And that's, that's actually in some ways even the more challenging piece of this is how do we get past those kinds of concerns in order to feel safe and to, sh to show us our whole selves in everything that we do. Uh, we have a question uh, to clarify when uh, we were talking about how the, your program is actually conducted. So do the certificate students have to attend in person for the week or can they accomplish the program uh, entirely virtually? They do have to come in person for the on-campus seminar. And that's by design because uh, we're dealing with really difficult issues. We, we, we utilize a lot of case studies. And our sense is, while you can do a lot of that online, you really need a person-to-person -person exchange to have those kinds of difficult conversations. Uh, we, we do build a very nice uh, community sensibility online before the students come on campus. But the on-campus experience is deep and rich, and we keep people pretty busy from nine in the morning, oftentimes till nine at night, and, and nobody wants to leave because the, the learning is so powerful. And one of, the, one of the great benefits of the program, aside from the instruction and the application and the projects, is the network that people create with other leaders within the Jewish community. And that's really valuable. When something happens in your community, uh, there are people within the community that you want to reach out to, but sometimes we gain added benefit by having an outside perspective. And if you can call another lay leader, another professional across the country in another community and get some advice, and that's that's just a really valuable addition and another tool that you have in your tool chest. Yep, I, that, uh, I think is certainly very important. Um, would rabbis be interested in your program? Uh, they would be, and we've had several rabbis in the program. Uh, I'll tell you one funny story, which actually I think speaks to the fact that we oftentimes think about anti-Semitism differently and we think about responding to it differently. Uh, in our first cohort, we had two rabbis in the program, and it was uh, the, the on-campus seminar was the week uh, when they announced the Day of Hate. You might remember that. There was a sort of fringe group somewhere in the Midwest, I forget, it was Iowa or Idaho. I know it started with an I, it wasn't Illinois. And they made these threats that seemed very uh, not credible at all. Uh, but in a certain sense, because we kept responding to them, we elevated the message of these uh, of these fringe groups. Uh, thankfully, again, nothing happened. But the response in the classroom was really interesting to see. Many individuals all of a sudden started going on social media, posting messages, warning their community. And we had a, we had a great conversation about why they were doing that, because it didn't seem like a, a credible threat. It didn't seem like it was a big thing. But there was a really interesting response, which is, if something, God forbid, would happen, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't prepare the community or make a statement. The other thing was true was once other people in the community made statements, uh, our leaders felt like they had to make statements as well. But the interesting part about the rabbis is we had one rabbi who immediately wanted to send out a message saying, we can't assure your safety and you should stay home on Shabbat. And the other rabbi who said, everybody should come and it's going to be a Shabbat of love. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great conversation. I wasn't sure either one of those was exactly the right approach, but it was a really interesting discussion about how we think about our own communities, how we how we signal and message what we're thinking, and how we you know take into consideration how our community members and others might be feeling. So yes, yeah, rabbis are welcome, and they do participate in the program. And we should encourage our rabbis to think about that if, uh, if possible. We have another question. Um, so much of anti-Semitism training is spent on understanding what anti-Semitism is. Yeah. Uh, we believe it believes that we have reached the point that understanding anti-Semitism is fairly clear. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but okay. Mm -hmm. I think we need to shift our focus, he says, from understanding to actually combating. How does my daughter, University of Maryland, decide which, with or to combat SJP taking over the campus on October 7th? Yeah. How do I prepare my child in high school for their freshman year? How do they combat encampments and interference of registering for classes and going to classes? Yeah. That yeah. they may may not be in your Ballywick here, even your program, but no, it's, it's in that? my Ballywick, and I think it's an excellent question. I would say the definition part is a complicated one. Oftentimes we see something and it feels very clear that this is anti-Semitism. Sometimes it's less clear, and it's a really interesting question of how we define anti-Semitism and whether or not we wanna make um, everything that we see that feels like anti-Semitism into an anti-Semitic incident. 
because in a certain way it waters down the conversation, right? If every time there's a comment made, I'll give you one example. I had a colleague who said to me, my boss said, you know, you must be really good at finance because all Jews are great in finance. Now, the boss intended it as a compliment. The person took it as kind of an anti-Semitic trope. And, the, and, and it's an interesting question. Do you report that as anti-Semitism or that's an opportunity to educate somebody? So it is, th there are some definitional questions. There are three main definitions that oftentimes get a lot of attention. Uh, the IRA definition, the Jerusalem uh, definition, and the Nexus uh, definition. They're different. Uh, they're, the focus is, is really a, a little bit different as it pertains to Israel in particular and, and, and Zionism and anti-Zionism. So I don't think it is always clear, though in some cases it's pretty clear. The more interesting question, I think, and I would agree that there is a need for action. And uh, we, we named this program the Certificate in Combating Anti-Semitism, and we thought long and hard about what combating means. And I'm not sure that it's the right word necessarily. Sometimes it's about addressing, mitigating, preventing, responding to. There's lots of different ways we could think about it. For us, combating was important because it did have that element of act activity, of proactivity, of action. And I think on college campuses and other spaces in particular, one of the things that we can do is make sure we're aware of what the policies are, that we know which kinds of people in the administration to talk to, and how we can have those things enforced. Because I think sometimes the challenge we have in high schools and colleges is that uh, it's a little unclear what we mean by uh, you know, freedom of expression, what's permissible on campus, who are the right people to talk to. Um, sometimes it's not the right strategy to go and uh, directly address people who are protesting or in encampments or saying hostile things. We really need to follow processes and bring the right authorities into the conversation. Uh, and, and, and I've noticed that in some colleges where that happens, there are better results. Uh, I'll share my, my alma mater for graduate school was the University of California, Berkeley, which has had its fair share of challenges. Uh, though every time I speak to colleagues there, they say, um, we hear only the bad things. We don't hear some of the more constructive things that have happened on campus when we get together for dialogue, when we work with the right administration. And so we do have to balance what we're hearing and what's in the press and what we hear from certain students uh, with, with the sort of larger initiatives that we take. Somebody once framed it pretty well to me. If you're at a high school, and you're a parent, and you hear about an anti-Semitic incident, right? It, it may not have affected your student, but you feel as if it did affect your kid. And then when you hear about 20 of them, maybe none of them affected your kid, but it now feels like an oppressive number of things that have happened. And of course you feel very personal about it. So part of it is stepping back, trying to assess the situation, but a lot of it is really understanding the policies, the procedures, and the things that we can do uh, in order to try to combat it. Sometimes it's about education also. Right now, I find that in many places, there's a lot of polarization. It's difficult to enter into constructive conversation, even about things not related to Israel anti-Semitism. But I think we have to keep trying to have those conversations. My experience is when you can begin to engage with people uh, in a civil kind of way, oftentimes you can make more progress than if we just become uh, sort of polarized in our, in our debates and start yelling at each other. So there are a lot of different strategies, I would say. One of the things that's important in our program is understanding the context of the situation. There's some cases where political lobbying makes the most sense, and there's others where a direct conversation with the school board is helpful. So I think stepping back, understanding the context, and thinking about what the, the range of actions that we should be taking uh, is helpful. But I agree that we should be taking actions and not just talking uh, philosophy and theory. <laughs> I agree with, with that as well. But also in terms of the, the question asking about the, the daughter at Maryland, so I'm on the, the board of George Mason Hillel, you know, the director and others at Maryland. We need to find out how well Hillel itself is training their staff to be able to deal with it. This is different than what we have had on campuses uh, some years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that Hillel itself is undergoing a change to understand what they can do, not just to uh, create a safe place, safe, uh, place for the students, or what they can do with college administrations um, uh, in terms of doing that. So I'm advocating when I'm talking to Hillel people, they themselves have to look at that and that their training to work in Hillel may not have included all that we think today they may need. Yeah, um, and the good news is I think Hillel has done some really good things in the Campus Climate Initiative and the Academic Engagement Network outside of that as engaged with administrators. So there are good programs that I think are making a difference. Um, Part of what we sometimes talk about in our program is how do we coordinate the efforts across different organizations to make the most impact? 
because sometimes we address anti-Semitism in individual and unique ways without thinking about how they might work together or might work at cross purposes with each other. I think that's another really important thing that we in the community need to think a little bit more about. When do we bring people together? Where do we sort of add on and get, gain power by having a variety of different programs that are addressing a particular situation? So there are a lot of important things that are being done. How do we maximize the benefit of that work? Very good. Um, you've stated that uh, you seek to place anti-Semitism into conversation with other issues, with other kinds of bigotry, hatred, and bias. How has the resurgence of anti-Semitism, especially since October 7, been received in your opinion in other minority communities who have also experienced hate, such as Muslims, Blacks, and Latinos, among some? Yeah, I, I would say it's complicated and it varies by individual sub-communities. One of the things we do know historically is that increase in anti-Semitism usually comes with a rise in Islamophobia. And we have seen that even now, even after October 7, though obviously this raises different kinds of questions in some ways. Um, one of the things that we know, and Deborah Lipstadt, uh, you know, who's a great scholar in this area and has done some important political work, she has this wonderful book called Here, and uh, I think it's called Here and Now or something like this. It's a series of letters that she wrote um, representing conversations that she was having with another faculty member and a student. She points out that um, when we have bigotry and hatred of any kind, uh, anti-Semitism rises. And when we have anti-Semitism, other hatred and bigotry also rises. They're, they're not disconnected. Anti-Semitism is a virulent form of hatred and bias, in this case, very specifically addressed to Jews, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so much of the same kind of language and the way that we talk about these things and the developments are very similar uh, on, on the one hand. And I would say on the other hand, sometimes they're quite different. And sometimes the very specific aspects that deal with Jews are different. That's why some of the discussions in the diversity, equity, and inclusion realms become really challenging, where those kinds of initiatives deal only with issues of race or primarily, and don't see Jude Jews and Judaism as a racial issue, and so sort of um, almost see Jews as oppressors, uh, as white settler colonias, colonial settlers, uh, and so sort of marginalize Jews and don't want to deal with the Jewish question or anti-Semitism. And I've heard stories where people might go to some of these meetings and people say, well, we don't want to hear what you have to say until you acknowledge your white privilege. Well, those are really challenging conversations because Jews are a minority in a significant way. Um, they have often been racialized. Um, the Jewish community is very diverse and doesn't include only certain kinds of people. And we obviously have a history of oppression and trauma. And so trying to get people to understand those kinds of things in those broader conversations is important. So putting us in the broader context, but also understanding the unique aspects of the Jewish experience and of anti-Semitism. Well, that leads me to another question I was uh, wanted to ask uh, in terms of how these other communities are and how we are representing ourselves. How does your program position anti-Semitism alongside of anti-Zionism? How do you think Jewish leaders have dealt with these two subjects in the face of hate uh, before and especially since October 7? Yeah, I think one of the sessions that we have is on anti-Zionism, critique of Israel and anti-Semitism and their relationship. Um, and what I'll say is that increasingly, I think particularly as we understand Zionism to be complex, and a core component of Jewish identity, it's hard to imagine anti-Zionism not slipping into anti-Semitic discourse and ideas. The same is sometimes true, but not always around critique of Israel, because as the many definitions remind us, one could have a legitimate critique of the state of Israel and still not be anti-Semitic. But when Israel is called out uh, for specific things that uh, represent double standards uh, or differences in the way that other groups are treated, it can slip into anti-Semitism. I do think October 7th has obviously highlighted some of those issues, but they've been there a long time, which is why the IRA definition came out, I think, already in 2015 or 2016, uh, based on a lot of European conversations and particularly the, the, the sort of central role of Israel in some of these conversations. Uh, it's a complicated topic, and we spend a lot of time on it in our session uh, on campus. It's, a, as you might imagine, a very heated component of the discussion. But I think part of what we try to introduce people is understanding the context in which it's stated. I, I'll just give you an example. Is the call for a Palestinian state anti-Semitic? Is a call to free Palestine from the river to sea anti-Semitic? Those are two very different things. And the way that we talk about them, the way we frame them and understand them could lead to very different kinds of conclusions and certainly different ways of talking about them. So I, you know, anti-Zionism from my perspective is becoming harder and harder to separate from some of the anti-Semitic discourse. 
question of Israel, I think, is still a challenging one because um, th there is legitimate critique of the state. The question is, when is it legitimate and when is it not? Nelson, do you have a question? Yes, I do, and thank you. Uh, do we need a um, change of the laws, equal opportunity laws, at the federal and the state levels, particularly to address anti-Semitism and maybe even the international Holocaust definition to be reinforced? And what I'm saying, do we really need the laws to be enforced to fight anti-Semitism, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I know, for example, in the in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, there's been a lot of discussion for oftentimes on, on the right, it's accused that they're using the anti-Semitism as a, as a tool to get rid of DEI and affirmative action and other kinds of things. And on the left, it's now become weaponized as a kind of anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic <laughs> exercise. And the truth may be somewhere in between. And I think what you're right is to suggest that the laws should be reviewed. And by the way, they should include a lot of different categories, not only about race and gender and class, but all sorts of things related to ability and religion and other areas where we want diversity, equity, and inclusion. The second part I think is also true, which is um, once we have uh, laws and rules and guidelines in place, they do need to be enforced. And I think sometimes those things, particularly in the school settings, are not the case, which is why I suggested earlier, one of the ways of acting, uh, you know, providing action against anti-Semitism is to make sure we're clear what the rules and policies are so that we can demand that they're enforced. So oftentimes I think they don't get, uh, either we don't remember what they are or they get sort of swept under the carpet or we don't enforce them equally across the board. So I would, I would, I would agree with you. I think both things need to happen. One is a serious review. And the second is once we've made real policy to make sure that it's enforced. Thank you. I think I Alexander has been if, trying to get a comment, yeah. I can see that if you have these types of uh, discussions amongst your uh, your students, and it could be very stimulating, is what we're not, would be nice saying, but it could really, it could almost be right, uh, almost as good as a, a rabbinical discussion of JTS and <laughs> Okay, well, there's no right answer, so we're going to stay up all night, and we're still not going to make that. Well, what I'll say is that um, there may not be a right answer, but there are there are, there are reasonable answers and responses in particular contexts. So like, sometimes I feel like when you have the conversation about going through case studies and presenting a variety of positions and exploring the gray, the challenge you might run into is inactivity. That's not what we're suggesting. We are suggesting that there may be responses in certain settings, but we want to understand the full context before we say, here's the three things you must always do. Because sometimes those are the right things and sometimes they're not. But Alexander, I know you wanted to say something. Do you research funding sources of the different anti-Semitic movements or groups or act actions? So in our program, we don't do that. We actually do a flip side of that, which is we look at the funding sources for the uh, combating anti-Semitism organizations to understand what their theories of change are, what their goals are, and where they're similar and different in their strategies. But our program hasn't been involved with sort of looking at the anti-Semitic groups themselves and their funding. There is good research, you know, and I think other organizations, that has not been a focus of our program. Mm -hmm. It's an important element, but it's not something that in the, in the short time we have in our program that we do. Thank you on that, uh, Alexander. Um, uh, Dean, you, you've cert stated the certificate is not prescriptive, but rather it's enabling Jewish professionals to understand the assumptions and positions of others. Nonetheless, can you offer examples of responses by Jewish leaders in the face of anti-Semitism and maybe point out a couple of examples of perhaps what to do and maybe a couple of examples of what not to do? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're complicated and they vary. And one of my sort of favorite examples, which I alluded to before, is that sometimes when we're dealing with social media issues, our first uh, yeah. action is to immediately respond and to forward it and to argue with people online. And that's probably the wrong strategy in most cases, because what we're doing is we're elevating and we're uh, amplifying the message of the haters themselves. That's exactly what they want. So we have to begin to think about when we respond and how we respond and for what purpose. One of my colleagues likes to say, every time there's a Hamas issue and a congregation, so many of you will, will, will feel good about this, congregation comes out and says, we condemn Hamas. Like Hamas doesn't really care all that much. <laughs> so what is, what is the purpose of our condemnation? It's in order to uh, bring our community together to signal the values of our congregation or of our community. Thinking about why we're communicating before we actually communicate is actually a very valuable kind of thing. Now, in terms of direct kinds of actions, sometimes there are important things that we do. I've spoken to a number of my JCRC colleagues. 
Sometimes it's important to have a public conversation where we call out a particular speech that somebody might have made or a particular action they might have taken. And that needs to be in the public domain and it needs to be sort of and publicly recorded. But other times that's not really the most successful approach. And actually what's helpful is to have coffee with the offender in a small coffee shop outside of the community, share with them the impact and the challenges that aris have arisen because of their comments. And sometimes you can have a lot more uh, success that way. I think sometimes we've seen very direct actions, say at some of the universities where federation or other groups have come in and levied lawsuits. Those have been really successful in some cases. In other cases, when we don't understand the full context, that can blow up in your face. And I've heard in some schools where they were making real progress behind the scenes, and then we came in and we, we filed a lawsuit, and all of a sudden there were, nobody was willing to work with the Jewish community anymore. So again, I think there are lots of different examples. It's understanding the specific case and having a direct connection to it, engagement with the situation, makes the chances of it being successful much higher. Uh, and there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, you know, sometimes we have theories of change that are about advertisements or about reaching out to particular groups or providing experiences to leaders in certain communities. Those can all be very good. I just think they need to be researched, understood. They need to be evaluated. It's one of the things that we have learned to sort of to Alexander's question, the, the flip side of it is not only what are the theories of change, but how do we evaluate the success of the programs that we put into place and know whether we should continue to invest in them or try something different? And the challenge we have is that we, I believe we're never going to fully eradicate anti-Semitism. It's always gonna exist in some sort of latent form. Question is how do we mitigate it? How do we respond to it in effective ways? And that requires us to evaluate the strategies that we employ and to think about how they can be more successful. That's a very, very good answer on that one. And that one can certainly go on and be a endless uh, discussion. Um, you have many more programs than just the certificate. Can you tell us about some of the things that you offer at the Institute? Yeah, thank you for asking the question. We have one other certificate. Um, it's a certificate in Jewish leadership and it's in partnership with Northwestern University. Uh, it's a great partnership. We've been working with them for many years. Uh, they had a Jewish president, Morty Shapiro, uh, who was a friend of mine. And we sort of created this program through the School of Professional Studies and spurred us. And so uh, we do a, a hybrid version, which is some online and some on campus. In this case, we also do a fully online version of the program. And it's comprised of four modules. One deals with um, sort of models of Jewish leadership, one on communications, one on collaboration, and one on leading change. And it's a really powerful program. We've had lots of people, both lay leaders as well as professionals through that program over the past 15 or 16 years. Our graduate programs, there's a few of them. One is our MA in Jewish Studies. Um, this is a sort of serious, rigorous program that has a core co series of courses, but also opportunities to take electives and text courses in core areas. Um, and that uh, program has, has comprised of uh, 16 courses, 48 credits. Most students, uh, all, almost all of our students are part-time. They take this program over the course of several years. Some of it is online. And then once a year, we have an intensive seminar on campus for students. We have an MA in Jewish Professional Studies which is a combination of Jewish studies, leadership, and nonprofit management. And it's an amazing program that really reaches a lot of communal professionals in the mid to senior level. What I love about the program is that it's thoroughly integrated. So you can take a Jewish studies course, but it has contemporary leadership application, and you can take a, a strategic management or supervision course, and it has Jewish texts and Jewish ideas and Jewish experiences. So fully integrated throughout, oftentimes through case studies, and it also adds a kind of mentoring or coaching component as well. It's a really powerful program that has uh, had a lot of success. We have a regular version and we have a track for executives who have more than 12 years of experience. And then Spurtis is unique in that we have two doctoral level programs in Jewish studies. One is a doctor of Hebrew letters that's intended for people who have a really significant background in Judaica, oftentimes rabbis who wanna get additional academic depth in a particular topic. Uh, and then the other is a Doctor of Science in Jewish Studies, which is a continuation of our master's program. Jonathan Sarna, a friend of mine who teaches at Brandeis University, used to say that the doctoral program is a, is a doctoral program in Lishma. It's a doctoral program in study for the sake of study. The majority of students in that program have graduate degrees in other fields, but they really want to delve into Jewish studies. And I'll share with you, a couple of years ago, I taught a seminar with seven doctoral students Six of them had PhDs in other topics, and it was a most amazing seminar because people came with such different perspectives and backgrounds and knowledge 
And the students here at Spurtis are really special. Um, they're, they're really one of the assets of our institution. They're highly motivated. They care about their communities and their personal learning. And although I give a lot of reading, they usually do about three times as much reading when they come to class. They're always asking for extra books and other things to work on. And it's just wonderful to be around a group of highly motivated, really intelligent, uh, amazing students. So we have a great faculty, we have great students. It makes it fun to come to work every day. Excellent. Sounds like a terrific uh, program. Uh, we hope you'll also be a part of our um, of our convention next year. And uh, I think a lot of people would very much benefit from, from hearing uh, from you. All we have time for one more question or comment. If anyone wants to make a question or comment. So I'll share with you, when I when I used to finish class, I would ask students if they had questions, comments, or regrets. And then I was teaching in Boston, and they said to me, we'd like to change that. We think it should be questions, comments, or compliments. So one more question, but then if there's questions, uh, comments, or compliments, happy to get those as well. Nelson, which one are you going to go with? <laughs> well, first, I'll start out with a compliment. And thank you for being here, just like Irv said. Very informative. Uh, the question I still have, though, is... Uh, we have different organizations we can't go to, and you briefly addressed this, Brandeis Center, Hillel, yeah. Chabad. I don't know where to refer the students to that might have a problem. Yeah. And maybe there should be an overall arching organization like you addressed, or some kind of chart to show us which one to refer people to. to. Is anything like that being worked? Unfortunately not. I mean, you know, the Jewish community is not different than other communities in some ways. I think we do a really good job of um, organizing in some areas, but not in others. And one of the exercises we do, as I mentioned, is looking at the variety of different organizations, the type of programs, the theories of change, where their funding comes from. I do think there's a need for that, and that might be a great funding opportunity for a foundation to say, bring representatives of these various groups together to think about it. Sometimes I feel like we... Um, outside of anti-Semitism, but in anti-Semitism as well, are in competition with ourselves. But in this case, we're trying to solve a really intractable problem, and we would benefit from trying to understand how all the different pieces fit together. And I'll share with you, that's one of the reasons we chose to focus on executive directors and senior leaders, because we felt there weren't a lot of programs for them. And I didn't want to get into college administrators and DEI officials and other groups because it felt like those were being addressed in other areas. So I couldn't agree with you more. I do think there's a need to have a a sort of coordinated approach. And, uh, you know, when we bring our students together, we, we begin those conversations, but but there's definitely a need for it. And I hope we can make some progress in that area. Thank you. Uh, we have our last question from Jeff Shulman. So, so <clears throat> on the compliment part, there is no greater compliment than the, the fact that my child is currently uh, one of your, in one of your cohorts. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, along the lines of what you, how you were just answering uh, Nelson is, um, does, do you, um, you know, yes, we have multiple organizations that do multiple different things. Is there some place in either in your teaching or in another teaching um, where you can really get a sense of who the players are and what their focuses are? Mm -hmm. and and how to leverage, um, especially whether it's with anti-Semitism or something else, how to leverage all of that. Yeah, in our program, we have started to do a bit more of that in two ways. One is we have a session that looks at threat assessment and trying to understand what the various types of threats are and what are the not only strategies to address specific threats, but what are the organizations that do work in those particular areas, like secure network and things like that. But the other part of it is we've added an evaluation part and that is how do we evaluate the um, specific strategies and organizational approaches in different contexts? It's only the beginning of a conversation. This is a certificate program that is only a couple months in duration. It's not, you know, it's not a, a long program, but it, it at least identifies some of those questions and begins to explore them. I think it needs a lot more attention. And you know, I would I would suggest that coming out of this, there's an opportunity to think about getting a group of us together at different organizations to write a piece together to do that sort of charting and that sort of uh, mapping of the community network that we're doing, to think about where there's overlap, where there's differences and where we can be most effective together. But there is a need for that, there is no question. Uh, we touch upon it, but I, you know, I, I, I would be dishonest if I said we get into great detail because we can't really jump into everything. Uh, and part of what we're trying to do in the program is give people the skills to be able to ask more questions, 
to sort of look at the nuance and the on the context in each individual situation, but there's you know obviously limitations uh, given the time. Perfect. Dean, thank you so much. It was just great. I think you definitely hit the mark with a lot of our members. And all these folks here are certainly influential, either current or past leaders. And it's great that they're all going to be students. I appreciate that. And that they can talk to their rabbis and their local Hillel directors and the local JCR. See, I do know that uh, one of the people at George Mason, one of our staff people, did attend your session. Uh, okay. Leon, and uh, and I think that all the Hillel direct, all the Hillel staff, where possible, should go through all that. Okay. But I appreciate it very much. We certainly hope to see you in uh, Chicago next year. Um, anything you'd like to close with? Uh, just with gratitude, I know this is a difficult topic, and I know that your group does a lot of work in this area. I've seen some of the impressive presentations that you've had, and I just want to thank you for staying engaged and for doing this important work. It's uh, We don't always get credit for it, especially on the lay side and or professionals, but everybody that is toiling in these difficult times uh, deserves a lot of credit. These are, these are not easy times. I, I feel uneasy every day with what's going on in Israel and what goes on around the country, and uh, so just gratitude for taking the time to do these kinds of programs and to do the important work that you do. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dean, for spending an hour with us. Everybody, thank you all. You all have a wonderful night and uh, a very safe and happy uh, Labor Day weekend to everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, guys.